Hi, I'm Peter Flynn, and I'm the owner of Bay State Perennial, and we've been here for going on 30 years. We undertook a lot of uh, big projects uh, this spring, so we're frantically trying to get everything done, uh, but we're getting there. Uh, these are some of our, our major borders out here in the parking lot, and the borders serve a couple of purposes. First of all, they help us sell plants. They uh, allow customers to see the plants used in a real life setting. And uh, also, they serve as a source of propaga propagating material for us. So we get a lot of our sale plants from the borders uh, by dividing the plants or taking cuttings or whatever. It's, it's a lot of work, um, but I love doing it. And people love them. So, uh, you know, so we keep so we keep doing it. Very labor intensive. We're uh, everything here seems to be very labor intensive. We're virtually organic. We use very few chemicals, and uh, we don't use a lot of machinery. Most of it is a wheelbarrow and a shovel. We're basically a, a perennial nursery that tries to concentrate on newer varieties. Uh, with a, with a big helping of uh, tried and true classics. We do uh, great customer service here. We uh, spend a lot of time with customers. Um, we try to give them as much information as we can. I spend most of the winter making signs for the, uh, for the retail section uh, that are very extensive and very helpful and people really seem to like them it's so it's kind of self-serve they can either go through if if they would rather be left alone they can go through and read the signs and get a lot of information or, or they can ask for help and we're, we're, we're always ready to do that and we never skimp on that uh, would you like to see some of the greenhouse uh, sure. take uh, a peek inside yep. why don't we go over and we'll uh look into some of the overwintering houses and you can see how we do uh store plants over the winter these are just more borders here and um i mean as if we didn't have enough borders we're adding more and uh so this is one that's growing here and uh we hope it turns out to be a great border and from here on in this is all part of the sales area all of this uh, and there are more borders out there they're really the place is uh ringed with uh borders so, let's go down here and we'll look in some of the overwintering houses. So this is how we uh, overwinter uh, plants here at Bay State. It's a tent within a tent system. There, just come up here and you can peek in and see what I mean. Uh, the plants are clustered in the middle of the house and then I construct a little inner tent over those plants. And then we cover, then we, then we, then we cover the whole house with uh, with another sheet of plastic. There's no additional heat uh, involved. It's just uh, an inner tent uh, inside a bigger tent. And it works beautifully, I must say. We used to heat and it cost a fortune and we didn't do any better with artificial heat than without it. So this is proven, prove it. it's very labor intensive again to set up all these tents, but uh, uh, it works beautifully. This is the same deal, uh, but we're starting to empty it out. So you, uh, but it was the same deal, a tent within a tent. We also store plants right outside on the ground. They're covered with a special foam fabric and then a sheet of plastic. And uh, it's a very easy way, very inexpensive way to overwinter things. And that too works beautifully. We open for the season in late April. Uh, uh, in the past, we've been a little uh, over anxious and opened too early and regretted it. So this year, we're, we're going to wait until I think the third weekend in April. And um, we often found ourselves uh, sitting in the shed there, uh, freezing with no customers. So, you know, we thought this year we, we'd wait until it really warmed up. Perennials still seem uh, very popular, and there are newer ones coming along all the time. Uh, we do try to keep up. Um, it's frustrating because just when, often just when you think you have the newest one, it turns out you, you don't, there's yet a newer one, you know, that's come out. It's fun, we love doing it. It's a lot of work, but we love doing it. 
Uh, customers are great. People are really a pleasure. We're open from the end of April through the end of September usually. Well, I'm Harlan Bean, and this is Bean's Maple Distillery. It's not a sugar house or a sugar shack, it's a distillery. We tap about, um, on a normal year, we tap about 2,500 taps, 2,500 maple trees. And from that, we produce anywhere between 600 and 900 gallons of syrup a year. Um, most of our lines, we use pipeline mostly. We don't have any buckets out this year, although we've had them out in the past. But So most of our lines are on our property. Of the 2,500, probably 2,000 of our uh, or so are on our property and, and 500 are on neighbors and other people's property. Um, it's a pretty simple task. It depends. We need the, the warm days like today, but we need freezing nights. Ideal temperatures for us are 25 at night, 45 during the day. And from each tap, we hope to get a gallon of sap every day. So 2,500 taps, on a good day we get 2,500 gallons of sap. Uh, we've had a few few good runs this year where we've gotten over 3,000 gallons per day, and uh, you know some day, some days we get none or just a couple hundred. So most of my lines are on vacuum. It's a vacuum system that's actually sucking the sap out of the tree. We put a few less taps in, and by using the vacuum system, I don't need perfect temperatures. If it doesn't freeze at night, I can still get some sap from the trees doesn't hurt the trees at all it's just like if you cut a tree and you know the sap dribbles out of it a little bit uh, it still heals back over and it's fine um, so we have two big tanks one is my main line which is down off Conway Road and we'll go collect that every day and then I have another one up here it's also on Conway Road but uh, up towards Poplar Hill we'll go collect that and then uh, when we have enough syrup, or enough sap, we'll start boiling. We've been doing sap and syrup for years, generations in the family, but we built this sugar house in 1987. And everybody has, you know, a sugar shack or a sugar house, and he wanted something different. So he, he decided to call it Beans Maple Distillery. And it's kind of catchy and, and whatnot, but uh, it's the same exact thing as a sugar house. We do the same exact thing. Um, but that's pretty, that's pretty much it. We have. We used to set a lot of buckets. Uh, back when I was a kid, we'd set about 600 buckets and we collect them all with oxen. I still have oxen, but I don't use them to collect the sap anymore. Um, so, and we go through quite a process. When the syrup comes in, uh, we hope to have at least 2.0% sap. That means there's 2% 2, 2 is sugar. Um, this year it's been pretty good. We've had some 2.2% sap come in, and right now it's dropping as the year gets later. The sugar content drops. Right now we're about 1.6, 1.7%, which means it takes many, many more gallons to make one gallon of, of syrup. Uh, earlier in the year it was taking just under 40 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup. Right now it's taking all, you know, closer to 50 gallons of sap to make one gallon of syrup. Um, we bring it in here, right from the tanks. It goes through a filter process where we filter the sap. Then we run it through a reverse osmosis machine, which we can take that 2% sap, run it through the osmosis machine, and turn it into 12% sap. And that allows us to boil it a lot faster. We use, less, we use much less fuel. I burn with oil. Uh, we used to burn with wood and we'd go through about 30 to 35 cords of wood a year. Yeah. And uh, when my father was alive, he cut all that by hand throughout the year, cut it, stacked it, split it. Um, but as he got a little bit older, that was a little bit much doing 35 cord of wood a year, so we decided to go to oil. And, uh, you know, having that reverse, os reverse osmosis machine really cuts down how much oil we use. It also cuts down our boiling time. Uh, we can burn, we can boil with this rig here about 250 to 260 gallons an hour. That's gallons of sap. So, um, you know, before we had the reverse osmosis, if we had 2,500 gallons, that meant we were boiling for 10 hours straight. 
Now we can turn that 2,500 gallons into about 600 gallons and boil it in two hours. So the reverse osmosis saves us a lot. Why don't you come out back here and we'll start out back. So our sap, our raw sap comes in from the, from the trucks when we go to collect it, comes into this tank here. Then we'll run it through that pool filter and up into that real big holding tank. And we don't like to let the sap sit very long. Uh, it's got sugar in it, so obviously with warm temperatures, it'll start to spoil. So we like, when we get the sap, we like to boil it as fresh as we can, same day, if we can do that. So then once it's in there, that tank holds about 1,800 gallons. Once it's in there, it comes through here. So this is my reverse osmosis machine. And that sap, that 2% sap is coming in here and it's getting squeezed down, I call it, to concentrated sap. So now we have, that's concentrated sap and that is what we call permeate. It's, it's the clean water. It's uh, the reverse osmosis takes out the sugar water and the clean water. We use that clean water for cleaning up. And this, this is my vacuum pump. This is what's sucking the sap out of the trees. So that sap is coming in that top line. And what it does is, the key to making good syrup is to have fresh sap daily, as, as cold as you can get it and as soon as you can get it boiled. And you wanna, you wanna cook it, you wanna boil it as fast as you can. Get it from sap form to syrup form. So it comes in here and it's preheated. This steam from this, the evaporation is preheating our sap. Then it enters into this unit here and this is what we call, this is our steam pan. And if you can hear, that's an air blower in the back. We're injecting air into it. The sap in here is about 200 to 210 degrees. Not hot enough to boil, but by injecting the air into it, we give it a false boil so it evaporates more. Then it comes down into our big pan, which is doing the most of the work, and there's flues in here. The sap is coming in here, and it travels all the way down, all the way back, and then it enters into this front pan. As it goes through each tray, it's more and more concentrated. This is almost syrup there. When it reaches a temperature close to 219 degrees, which it's close right here, we draw it off. So we, we do it manually. Some guys have automatic draw-off machines. I prefer to do it manually. I don't know why, call me old fashioned or just plain old slow, but this batch is ready. So we'll take about two gallons off at a time. Today we're making um, dark syrup, or what's called robust. It's grade A. The old system would call it dark amber. The new system, which is universal now uh, throughout the United States, it's it's grade A, dark, robust. And that's probably our most popular syrup. And now that it's syrup, we'll run it through its first filter process. And usually I spill some so I get to lick my fingers, but. So when this, this finishing unit, we call it, when it gets full, it holds about 80 gallons. When it gets full, we'll put it through a, fi we'll filter it under pressure through the filter press and either we'll bottle it uh, in jugs for sale, retail sale, or we'll put it in 15 gallon stainless kegs or 40 gallon steel dr stainless steel drums. And from that point, the process of making our syrup is done. Then we, then we clean up and wait till next year. Hi, I, I'm Bill, Bill O'Bear. I'm the, uh, one of the owners of Bear Path Compost, which is formerly Bear Path Farm. Uh, our main uh, activity here is, is making compost for, uh, for use in gardens and farms and nurseries and, and those sorts of things. We've been in business for, this will be our 20th year and we produce about 2,000 cubic yards of compost a year. Uh, if you can visualize your normal size refrigerator, that's about two cubic yards for pe people who aren't familiar with volume. Um, we start with uh, 
various raw materials, or we call them feedstocks in the industry. We, we take material that's, that's high in nitrogen, in this case dairy manure. We also do a little bit of food waste. We, we compost the food waste from the town of Waitley and the elementary school. And we, we take these high nitrogen materials and, picks, uh, and mix them with materials that are high in carbon, like horse bedding, leaves, old hay, and we're also starting to work with short paper fiber, which, a, which is a, a waste product of the paper industry. So we, we mix these materials into, uh, we have a recipe, we mix them thoroughly, and then we put them into what we're going to call, these are all called windrows out here. Um, so these are compost windrows where the material is ultimately deposited. It sits for a couple of weeks or so, and then we go through what's called a turning cycle. And when we turn it with our, with our big front end loader out there, it mixes the material, aerates it, adds oxygen, and the aerobic bacteria that are in there start to increase and multiply essentially exponentially, ultimately starting out at you know, ambient temperature and getting up to not, uh, as high as you know, 140 degrees. And in those temperature thresholds, uh, weed seeds are destroyed as are pathogens. And uh, that's how we make it pretty much. What I might show you here is, and we can get a shot in there too. That's our storage area. This is greasy manure. Nobody would like to see this dumped in their driveway, right? This is after it's been turned into compost. It basically smells like soil. It's great as a, as a, it's a basically a soil amendment. It's not it's not a, a, a in lieu of soil product. You use it as an amendment. You mix it in with the soil. You can use it as a top dressing in perennial beds, or you know around trees and shrubs, and or or again incorporated in the soil for uh, both nutrients, uh, water retention, and all, also all the beneficial microbes that are that are in there. Uh, a teaspoon of that's going to have well over a million microbes that are very useful for the soil and, and plants. Shall we walk around a little bit? We, we uh, after our, our, our compost, we just finished turning this last week, this windrow here. Ultimately, this is gonna get run through a manure spreader to break up clumps, homogenize this, and then we put our surplus in here for sale directly to customers who either help themselves or we load their trucks as we did one this morning or load it in our dump truck and take it off to wherever it's going. We, we deliver to over 50 different towns in, in, in the Pioneer Valley. You know, I have customers who are people who say, well, what, uh, you don't do anything wintertime, right? No, we're, we're active all winter. We're, we're mixing, we're, we're, we're turning material. In January, we turned a bunch of windrows. And it's not dependent on, I mean, we could, it could be zero out here and you could still have the interior of a, of a windrow 120, 130 degrees. And the reason being is it's, as I tell people, it's like, you know, the, the microbes, they're the tiny, tiny little creatures and they, they live off of carbon and, 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 for, and, and also some, you know, protein as well. So they're, they're constantly breaking things down and then they expand in numbers. Uh, exponentially, you know, from, literally, there's zillions in these uh, untold numbers in, in these windrows. And uh, if you if you take all these tiny little bodies, and they're all eating things to give you off heat, just like we're we're 98.6, they're they they're accumulatively creating a, a tremendous amount of heat, which ends up uh, eventually working its way out of the windrow. And in the process, it de destroys weed seeds and, and, and kills pathogens. So, and, and they're and they're actually very good good for uh, for the soil and for and for plants. Normally, these windrows would be a little hotter after we do some turning. They will. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, if if you can get a shot of this. Uh, this temperature gauge is reading about 106 degrees, and what is it outside now? 48, 47, so it's quite a bit higher. Once this gets turned, the temperature is going to go up, and you might be able to see some of the heat in here, but Mike's going to dig into it. See that? Can you get that? Yep, we got it. And uh, when he turns it, there'll probably be a big plume, and this is actually not terribly hot. Uh, sometimes it, there is so much steam coming out 
that I, I have to wait a second for it to clear to see what I'm going to do. <laughs> so why don't you why don't you take a little bite in here well, over there somewhere, Mike? See what happens. can see it's pretty hot <laughs> and uh, this is in the very early stages of composting this this product won't be available till late summer early fall or something like that well we'll be we've got you know an, a few more turnings before it's actually ready and interestingly enough as this as we turn this material it, it actually shrinks we have about a, 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 a about a 45 to 50 percent reduction in volume from start to finish and actually what we're doing is giving off uh the the the, the material is broken down as these little creatures metabolize it they exhale carbon dioxide just like we do so in a sense this is giving off a lot of carbon dioxide but it's no different than if this material was spread on on a field somewhere and um and and just naturally broke uh, broke was broken down by 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 soil microorganisms now one thing that we are doing is we we are judiciously composting some materials that would n end up in landfills like a little bit of food waste we do more but there is a tends to be a trash problem with that and we are starting to work with short paper fiber which is which is a result of recycled paper and it en ending up in the um uh would, would normally end up in landfills so this material that those sorts of materials if they end up in landfills they actually produce methane gas from anaerobic bacteria which is 23 times more potent than carbon dioxide so it's much better to compost it than just bury it somewhere and that's pretty much what we do we we make compost we have lots of people buying it and uh, about seven months from start to finish you deliver oh yeah you deliver <laughs> We deliver all over, but you know, as I said, uh, we, we've been to over 50 different towns, and we have people coming. Well, we have people call from the eastern part of the state, but we just don't go out that way. We, we, we maybe go as far south as Springfield, and we have about a 25 mile an hour, mile radius. I'm Keith Bridewell, Brookled Sugar House. I've been at this for a long time. I started when I was 10 years old. Not obviously this big, but on a much smaller scale and I have over the years it's a hobby of mine that I've never um, never given up I enjoy it um, and so from 1974 is when I started with a neighbor of mine making just a couple of gallons on an open um, open pan and it slowly progressed into where I am today which on an average year, I'm making a little over 500 gallons of syrup per year on an average year for me. So I have um, about 1,200, a little over 1,200 taps this year, which is about where I'm always been in the last few years. Um, I run a vacuum system, which gives me um, a very good uh, amount of sap per tap. With the, the older style, when you just hung buckets out, you didn't get anywhere near as much sap per tap as you do nowadays with a good vacuum system. Um, the vacuum, the pipeline, it is doing all the collecting for me. So when I come home from work or get ready to boil, the sap is all collected here waiting for me. I don't even have to go, um, don't even have to go looking for it. And I can show you the, um, the syrup that's being made today as it's getting ready to be drawn off. This up here is an automatic draw off which measures the the temperature of the the syrup the syrup boils at seven degrees above the boiling point of water so that at any given time during the course of a day i have the barometer up there where i can set my the draw the temperature to draw off at 
and the syrup will come off when it's when it's ready. Hydrometer is it's actually very very accurate and if you come in a little closer you can see there's red lines on that hydrometer. The top red line if it was to float right at that red line that would mean it's syrups. It's not floating quite at that level there. You can see it's sinking down. A, whoop, it's sinking down a little bit below that. So where I drew off right here isn't quite quite ready, but so when that when that floats at the um, when it does float on that red line, then that's another indication that the syrup is ready. After the the syrup is um, completed and drawn. I can show you where I have in here. The syrup comes in here, and this is my finishing pan where I'll get it all hot to the point where I need to run it through uh, a filter press. And what the filter press does is it filters the syrup. It takes out the the impurities, um, any of the um, the solids the sh from the, the minerals that are in the syrup like that sample jar right there that is unfiltered syrup you can see it's cloudy if it was to take it and put it next to a if you put that next to a you can see one that's that one is cloudy and this one is much clearer it's um, that this has been this has been filtered and this is has not been um, that was just a sample I pulled today of what of what I made. You take a sample of your syrup and you would put it in the and you would and you hold it up to light and I know with the camera you're not going to be able to see but you would look through there and and you that's that's a method of grading the syrup based on the how dark it is. Um, as the season progresses the syrup tends to get darker, um, stronger flavor to the point where you're making your um, cooking syrup near the end of the year. Um, your light syrups aren't going to have that strong flavor to it so that it, if you use a light syrup in in for cooking um, you're going to be disappointed because you're not going to get a real strong maple flavor. After it's been filtered then it's ready to bottle. I store in, in um, kegs I use also from there as soon as it's been filtered it can go right into the individual bottles um, like that are right behind you. You know, any, any of these, these are, um, this is syrup that's been bottled and ready, ready to be sold. Quite frankly, I don't feel that the type of fuel you use has any impact on it. I mean, the old, many of the old ex people would all say they liked wood fired because it gave it a different flavor. Well, the, the, the wood, there's, as you can see, there's, I'm burning wood, but it, there's no smoke that comes if you had old pans where you know your smoke rolled around and got into the into the sap that would maybe affect the flavor but whether you're using oil and or wood in my my feeling is it's not gonna it doesn't affect the flavor at all tom olson i'm the production coordinator here at enterprise farm in waitley this is it's mid-march so this is the um sort of the first greenhouse that we start production in the enterprise is a 120 acre uh, vegetable organic vegetable production farm we have a csa that's anywhere from 500 to 700 members um we're trying to keep it at like 500 so we uh, we do wholesale too we do direct store delivery to um whole foods and we have um <clears throat> other various wholesale accounts so we have a it's sort of a um complex operation as far as like doing a farm plan for all those three factors all those three um facets of the farm so but this is basically how we start production everything is seated in uh flats that either have 98 or 128 cells um they get big, then we take them out and transplant them in the field. We have, think about enterprise, we have fields all over, um, sort of like in a five, 10 mile radius in both Franklin and uh, Hampshire County, which makes it kind of a challenge because they're, you know, there are various sizes anywhere from like a half acre to an acre to like 10 acres, 11 acres. I think there are like 26 different plots now that we have, so we have to, you know, you know obviously when you um, do an organic farm plan on a yearly basis, you have to follow a sort of three to five year rotational um, system 
for the crops you can't plant this plant the same crop in the same field year after year or even like two years afterwards so that's um that's part of the challenge is sort of assigning each crop to uh what field when you have so many crops probably plant maybe 30 varieties of different things of, of all sorts of vegetables from brassicas, tomatoes, um, things like fennel, root vegetables in the fall, um, which is especially popular for the CSA. So the greenhouse is where it's all, all, all the production starts and pretty much ends too. Um, this is the first, this is pretty much the first um, seeding for various things. Like we do a lot of kale, obviously. Every organic farm does a lot of kale. So this is kale dandelion um <clears throat> we also i just seeded some tomatoes down there too for the first time for the greenhouse that we have over here where we do greenhouse production um so what else kale dan we got some dandelion too uh we're seeding broccoli today so we're right at the start of the season this is this is what a farm looks like in march basically right before you dandelion as in the weeds that nobody wants in their lawn yeah, yeah. Well, it's just, you know, it's a special kind of variety. A lot of people, we sell a lot of dandelion, actually. It's a, you'd be surprised. Um, we grow, we also, since we uh, um, have a lot of Jamaicans who work here during the summer, too, they, we grow callaloo, which is something that, um, it's a big crop back, a greens crop, sort of similar to dandelion. And um, I say, what else does this kind of, it's kind of like, uh, it's, it's a green, you know, stir fry with onions and garlic. Yeah. So... So the, that's sort of the interesting thing about the valley is that there's so many Jamaicans around and Callaloo is such a big crop that it's like, you know, Callaloo is almost specific to this area during the summer where it's like nowhere else other than Jamaica. So that's sort of a small fact. We start everything here in Greenhouse 3 and then the, we expand to the other two. We've got two greenhouses there. Um, three on the other side. So these, put out the field, these, these will eventually be transplanted into the field. So everything starts here, except for the things that we direct seed, like um, uh, carrots, chard, you know, squash, etc., like that. So, so your, uh, 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 can you do it with a machine or a truck, or do you have to hand? No, there's a, we have a specific, um, tra it's called the transplanter, that is towed behind a tractor where two people or three people, depending on the crop, that's being transplanted sort of sit low to the ground and you know plop the it's called plugs once these get big they're called plugs so you'll carry you'll have little um tray tray carriers like this and so you'll sit kind of low and you'll stick them into the ground so you've seen the black plastic in the fields yeah, yeah so the, you go through that and you punch holes into the plastic and then the tractor goes over that and the, the people drop the plugs in it's an interesting system well this is our um, farm store uh, we this time of year in the winter we are partnering with local and regional farms um, so our produce is coming from um, all over the East Coast at this point. Um, we have sweet potatoes here from um, North Carolina. Um, we have some eggs from cage-free eggs from, uh, from Vermont. Um, we have some butternut squash from Vermont. Um, some uh, Celery is and peppers from Florida, um, potatoes from Canada. So we have things from all over the spectrum. Um, we even get some citrus from, this is from California. We try to get it from Florida, but um, we can't always get it from there. We're kind of like a, a distributor, partnering with local and regional farms. Um, during the summer, it's all of our own produce that we grow, unless we're bringing in specialty items, such as apples from local orchards. Um, so we're about halfway through our, uh, our winter share um, now. So this is um, a good idea of what we, what we have this time of year. We get some greens from Florida, lettuce and kale, cabbage as well. This is a really great um, local company that grows their own mushrooms. Right in Hadley, right down the road. We have a lot of produce from Red Fire Farm, uh, like this parsnip. CSA members will come to the farm 
and they will pick out their produce. So they can pick out whatever they want when they're at the farm. They get um, a dollar amount. We call this the um, market share. And so depending on their size, they can just um, pick out whatever amount of produce as long as it equals that dollar amount and we have prices on everything. Or people have the option of choosing this list. If they were to get delivered their farm share, this would be what would be in the box. Um, but since they're coming to the farm, they don't have to stick to that list, although some people do. Or they start off with the list and then they might switch something out if they don't like it. Also, our CSA members who pick up at the farm have the option of going out in our pick your own garden. And we have everything from all different types of um, bell peppers, hot peppers, specialty peppers, heirloom tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, regular tomatoes, um, flowers, herbs, all different things that people can, um, can pick from our pick your own. And that is a huge uh, reason why people come here because most of our CSA members will preserve um, food and um, so they can really get a bounty out of their, um, especially out of their summer share. You know, it seems like every time you go to work with the bees, you're going to get stung. Huh. Because when you're picking up the frame, and uh, there's usually a bees are crawling around, this is why you have a smoker. And a smoker is only to calm them down. And when you smoke the bees, you give them a few puffs of smoke, okay, into the entrance. So you go up to the, you go up to the hive, and you go like that. And the smoke goes in there. The bees actually go towards the honey, and they fill up on honey, and they can't bend over with their stinger to uh, sting you. Now, not all of them are going to fill up on honey. There's going to be a few stragglers. So when when you uh, actually actually pick up a frame, they're walking along the top of the frame. There's going to be one that you know, it gets on your hand and all of a sudden he just wants to sting you for, for some reason. So he stings you on your hand, you get one on the palm, you know. But it's good for you because it prevents arthritis. You know, that's why people uh, will go to uh, beekeepers that are licensed to uh, work with um, people that have MS, multiple sclerosis. They give them a bee sting. And the venom in that stinger will, it's sort of like inoculation, but for some reason, the venom in it will help them to uh, walk. Mainly, this is where I do all my extracting when it's time for the season. This is the uncapping tank where I do all the, where I do the framework and, you know, all the frames. And you can see, I've got boxes up here where I store the, where... This is a good example of where the bees store the honey, all right? And right now, there's no honey in it now because this was last, last year's. This is called an extractor, all right? And the frame, once the honey's on here, the wax capping is off. It goes right inside, right in here. And what it does is when you turn it on, it turns and the centrifugal force of that, it just takes the honey right out and it goes right into this tank. Now, this here tank is a holding tank where after you process the honey, it goes inside here and uh, it uh, accumulates in here and then I, uh, I take it out of here. I have a a spigot here, which I can, uh, you know, draw it off and uh, do my bottling and so forth. This is the bee suit. If you want to get a good shot of that, what a beekeeper wears. There's different styles. There's different, uh, you know, uh, protectiveness. There's there's uh, gloves that a beekeeper uses. Pry bars for prying, because once the bees start producing honey. And they love to seal things up tightly. I mean, it's like you can't even get it off. You can't even pull this off. So this is what this is used for. So when you take that cover off, you just jam it like that. And you pull that cover off 
just like that okay now the frame the frame goes in here just like that and this is the entrance okay this is your bottom board this is a hive body and this is called the outer cover I do everything in here you know I, I build the all these well I have I don't build the wooden parts it's easier to get them manufactured I could build them here but it would just take too much time so it's easier for a company that are set up to do it every day and that's what they do and if I run out of parts this is what I do you know so it's amazing what these little creatures these little bees will do and these little nests these wasps nests are just the kind of my decoration my you know kind of makes it kind of a they have nothing to do with beekeeping no 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 those are wasps yeah. those are wild wasp nests I get in the fall time the honey from the stores usually comes from uh, a foreign country China China is one of the biggest producers of honey they import so much honey here that they can sell it for 18 cents a pound you cannot buy water for 18 cents a pound and the people that are buying it are your uh, cereal companies the thing about China is it's not 100% uh, honey they, they add corn syrup to it so they it's an additive so when you think you're getting real honey you're not getting real honey once you process it you spin it out you filter it through to get all the bee parts because in honey when they store the honey there's going to be all kinds of uh, different ma material matters like maybe uh, parts of uh, old oh I don't know maybe you know dead bees that maybe had fallen or something and they somehow got mixed into that you know into the honey when they stored it into the cells you're gonna find particles of that and debris and uh, once you spin it out you'll be able to see it all in in the filter bag you know my name is Alan Sanderson I along with my brother Brad and my son Jake run this farm here uh, we do about two and a half acres of flowers and a half an acre of tomatoes where we grow the tomatoes, actually harvest the tomatoes and sell them to local stores. Right now we're doing both. We got the flowers going. Most of them have been planted already. Uh, they should be ready for Mother's Day. And the tomatoes will be ready about the middle of May. As far as how long Fairview Farms has been here, we started on this property with the flowers in 1984. But uh, Fairview Farms has been in Waitley for, well, my son's the ninth generation farmer in Waitley, a Sanderson farmer. Uh, it started as a small dairy farm, grew into a larger dairy farm. Back in the early 80s, mid 80s, we grew a lot of tobacco, which was for cigars. That market has since dwindled. We got more and more into the flowers and greenhouse vegetables like the tomatoes. We also do about 100,000 mums every fall. This is a house full of geraniums, which will be ready again for Mother's Day, which is in about six weeks. We'll take a walk through and see what else we got. This house here is full of million bells. They're all on a bench and hanging up will be fuchsias. And they're a big time uh, Mother's Day gift. And they will be ready for Mother's Day. Doesn't seem possible, does it? Yeah, what you're looking at here is New Guinea and Patience with Dracaena in the middle. It's in a 12-inch patio pot and there's about 5,000 of these right here. As you can see, these are all on benches. And we do that to save room. There's one alleyway for every 30 feet. And if you want to get over to that side, you just crank the whole bench right over. Now you can get down that side. So we save about 30%, or we get 30% more growing area by having only one alleyway. In a normal greenhouse, you'd have an alleyway in between every bench. 
another few weeks, all these 10 inch baskets here with the hooks on them will be big enough, they'll need the space and they'll all be hung up in these areas. It'll be about two more weeks. So we'll have product on the benches and hanging up. This is our tomato house. These tomatoes were seeded back in January, about the 4th or 5th of January. They were transplanted into these buckets about the 1st of February. And in two months' time from now, which will be about the middle of May, we'll be picking tomatoes. And we'll continue to pick tomatoes until about the middle of July. So we get two months of picking out of here. These plants will actually touch the pipes above them. They'll grow 10 feet tall. And then we break off the top to stop them from growing. The last two weeks of picking, we're on step ladders. That's how we pick them. We use a lot of biological items for controlling disease and pests. You can see the grasses that are hanging up around the house. They have parasitic wasps in them that run around. They All they like to eat is aphids. So we don't ever have a problem with aphids because of these little wasps. But they're, you can see them with a the naked eye, but barely. And they just go around and take care of all our aphid, aphid population. These guys here, they're going through and they're taking off the suckers. He's going that way. So let's go down the other end and we can see him better. These here are suckers and they just keep coming. Every week we gotta go through this whole house and break off these suckers. Otherwise the plant, all the energy of the plant goes into the suckers and you won't get any tomatoes. There's a sucker here. So they break them off and throw them away. They also have to clip up the tomato. And we use these plastic clips. And you can put one on here. And that'll keep the tomato from falling down, especially under the weight. Each plant is gonna have over 20 pounds of tomatoes on it. And that much weight without these clips would be right on the floor. There's 4,000 plants in here. And then how many greenhouses? Well, we have this one that's a half an acre. We have the big one with the flowers in it, that's a half an acre. And then there's about an acre and a half of small greenhouses if you add them all up. Uh, one thing I failed to mention is these tomatoes, we get two crops a year out of it. So we'll have a crop this spring, which will go until the middle of July. Then we completely disinfect, throw away all these plants, start new ones. Around the 4th of July, we transplant out here in about middle of August. And in the middle of October, we're picking tomatoes again right up until just past Christmas. So you can get actual fresh tomatoes at Christmas time. Who do you distribute to? Uh, we do a lot with uh, Black River produce out of Vermont, Atkins, um, Pure Foods, River Valley Market, Whole Foods, um, Millstone, most of the small grocery stores around here as well as a few out in the Boston area. Wilson Farms takes quite a bit from us. Randall Farms down in Ludlow takes quite a bit. Well, last year we made 400 gallons of syrup and sold 10,000 gallons of sap. So we're right around 600 gallons of syrup. It started as a hobby, and I guess so it's like 12 hours a day, seven days a week out here. But that's just the way that is. Burn, right? yeah, it's like when it's, you got to make hay when the sun shines, Jim. You know, how, you ever heard that saying before? You got to make boil sap when, in the springtime when it's there no. because you can't let it sit around because it spoils. Because what happens is the sugar in the water creates a bacteria, makes darker syrup, and eats up the sugar. Just that simple. Uh, they're all my lines are come off North Street. I have a uh, tank at Sanderson's, and I have a tank down in my son Chris's house. And all the lines come down into high volume vacuum that doubles the production. There's about 6,000 taps that we produce for. So. And no more buckets. Oh my God. My leg, I, I couldn't do it. I, you know, it's just one of those things. If I had nothing else to do, Jim, yes, I could probably do buckets. But it's just, you know, now 
I started at five o'clock this morning, checking my tanks. They were running, one of them was running on the ground, one of them was, was full. I had to start collecting, so I had to start collecting sap. And um, we, I've been at it since, so. Oh, I made over 60 gallons of syrup today, so I've been putting it up in barrels, but I'm stainless steel barrels. Because it's one of those things, it's a wholesale market, you know, it's sometimes some stuff you have to wholesale, and you would never put it in stainless steel, plastic containers to wholesale out on a volume. A day like today, I had 6,000 gallons of sap to get rid of today. So, I just, this is, this is the first day I've ever made 5,000 gallons of sap to, through my sugar. Like Williams would like to get the extra sap so you keep running all the time. Oh yeah. So even when the sap isn't uh, running, mm -hmm. uh, they can still make syrup. They oh yeah. Back to them, you know? Well, and they'll have bus tours come through and uh, this. Sandy Williams, Williams Sugar House is in the business to make steam. They make steam, it draws the public in because they're right on Route 5 in Old Deerfield. And that's what sells the syrup. One of the biggest, operations we have sits right out there. See that green light through that window? Reverse osmosis. It takes 2% sap that's coming in like it comes out of the trees and takes half the water out of it and we're boiling 12% concentrate in the evaporator. What it does is we don't have to burn as much wood because <laughs> well, it'd be, you, we'd never get rid of it in, tw in, a, in a day, you know, uh, 24 hours. It, it's a, um, it t takes this evaporator from making two gallons of syrup an hour to 12 gallons of syrup an hour, pretty much. Oh, it, it's, abs you know, it's, it's electricity, but, you know, it's a machine, it's a, an expensive machine, but, you know, it's... It saves a lot of time. Oh, my God. And wood, you know, I mean, even if, even if the wood doesn't cost you anything, is you still got to put it on a pallet and process it and get it get it ready to go and get it in here. So, you made a whole barrel of soap. I did. I made a barrel of soap. Hello, my name is John LaSalle, and our family owns LaSalle Florists here in Waitley. We've been in business here since 1934. Uh, started by my grandfather and we are a traditional retail florist shop but we also grow a lot of cut flowers primarily and we grow annuals in the spring and we grow about four acres of outdoor cut flowers in the summer. This time of year we're growing freesia as our main crop which we'll see in the greenhouse a little later. We're also starting to bring in our Easter plants and we have uh, other cut flowers started and we're starting our annuals. So we'll take a look out in the greenhouse out here. We're getting ready to plant our annuals for uh, spring sales and these are some that, uh, coleus that we'll be having for sale in May or so. So out here, this is our main, uh, one of our main growing areas and we also use this for retail space. Uh, this greenhouse was built by my grandfather in 1934. So it's a little over 80 years old right now. You can see we've got Easter lilies and some other uh, Easter plants in here. Also we're growing asters, stock, dianthus, and snapdragons for cut flowers which will be uh, blossoming in, in May. We do Easter plants for about 35 different churches in the area and uh, the plants come from all over. We gather them from different sources so that they have a good selection available. Yeah, we're just at the end of our season uh, growing freesia and uh, These are our, our main winter crop. This is freesia. We've been growing freesia for at least 45 years here. And uh, we wholesale this to different places all around New England. We also sell to a lot of the local markets like uh, Whole Foods, River Valley, Foster's, uh, State Street and Cooper's. And uh, so uh, this is, we're pretty famous for this. This is one of, our, one of our best crops. We have a lot of people that come in just for the freesia. These are grown from a bulb and we save the bulb and condition them from year to year. The plants are actually native to South Africa and their dormant period is a uh, hot, dry summer. So they fit in really nice with our cool winters in here. We can keep them to a minimum temperature and they, uh, they like, like our particular spot here. These old glass greenhouses really are, are perfect for their growth conditions. Warm in here. Yeah. Tropics. Yeah, we rent plants for functions, a lot of them to UMass and for uh, different things. So we're going to be renting uh, a lot of palms out for churches next week for Palm Sunday. Oh, so you, and you kind of so we, we them and then we, take them back. Yep, yep. 
Uh, yeah. Never thought that was a night Yeah. We uh, for a lot of functions over at UMass when they have a speaker in or they have a yeah, they wanna... stage, you know, they want to decorate. Hmm. This is Nisami Farm. We're part of New England Wildflower Society. Um, that's that's been one of the oldest uh, national conservation plant conservation groups. Started around 1900. We um, acquired Nisami Farm. It's one of our sanctuaries. We have about five, five to seven of them around New England states. What's unique about Nisami is it's also our native plant nursery. So we grow uh, native plants from wild collected, mostly from wild collected seeds that we collect ourselves. These are common, common uh, native plants that we propagate here in the greenhouses. We sell them in our retail area up here at the building, and then we also sell them for co uh, contract growers who are doing restoration work and people who just want to. We have like meadow kits so people can um, kind of create meadows in their lawns and, and things like that. So I can give you a, a walk around the property. So uh, this was originally owned by the Augusts who uh, had a Christmas tree farm and trees and shrubs and they still live um, about a house or two over and so it was kind of um, transferred over to New England Wildflower as a as a property. It's about 75 acres it goes all the way down. This is our prop house where we do we have it all heated up and I can show you what we're doing inside there if you want to take a look. So these are some of our harder to grow uh, natives. They so we do some research and trying to different techniques to get them to propagate. Uh, this is some of our like mountain laurels and ericaceous. We've got some blueberries. This is the pitcher plant, which is a uh, not up yet, so you can't see it, but it's a bog, a bog plant. A lot of these need a cold period of stratification, so we'll sow them in the in, in December, keep them in a cold uh, greenhouse, and then we just moved them in here about a month or two ago, and uh, they started sprouting, coming up. You can see right here these guys, for instance, some grasses, and then what we do is we then sh um, divide these out into plugs. To grow off and I'll show you that that these are all of our milkweeds that our monarch butterflies love oh is it getting fogged up from the heat in here <laughs> we have to acclimate a little bit so in early March we start thinking about what we're going to propagate and we bring in the flats that we want to start uh, into the warm greenhouse and everybody starts germinating these are some flats that are germinating and then we have a crew of volunteers and interns and staff that will uh, divide all our seedlings into plug trays Watch that. Yeah. I'll give you a little example of that over here here's Kate our intern this year and she's she's uh, grading out Tiarella cordifolia which is a foam flower it's one of our woodland natives and so we put them in these little plug trays and these are gonna, they all get labeled for our, uh, the job is color coded and uh, yeah, we grow them off. And I believe last year we put out about 50,000 plugs, so about 50,000 of these guys um, to our custom growers and our retail. We supply, like I said, our retail and we also supply Garden in the Woods, our horticulture department uh, with plugs. They're in the middle of redoing the whole garden, so we're growing a lot of that off for them of native plants. We collect the seeds from wild populations. Um, we get permission from the landowners. Um, they're all common plants, so we don't touch any of those rare species. You've got fantastic germination. Yes, it really worked out well this year. We were seeing a little bit of uh, troubling mold, so we pulled, because they like to be under the shade a lot, so we pulled them out to kind of dry them off a little bit, but yeah. And we bottom water with rainwater, we found, for these guys. Just for these special guys, most of, most of them we have wells, but and yeah, just check out our retail space up there and see what we, we do. We also offer classes and workshops both here and at uh, Garden in the Woods in Framingham. Follow me in here. So yeah, take a look at our high tech ferns. So we're just start, starting to acclimate them to uh, a lower humidity, and that's why we have uh, these little mini hoop houses that we open up and allow the humidity to escape for a certain number of hours per day, and then we increase it every day by a little bit to get them ready to be transplanted and back down to the greenhouses. All kinds of fun things, microscopes to check them out.
And this is where we do our workshops. And we have them. And this is our, our garden shop, which is just starting to get uh, inventory in. We'll have books and pots and locally made items as well as um, all of our plant material. And that will be opening April 30th for the season. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Tim Nurse and I'm uh, one of the owners here at Nurse Farms. Uh, we're at 41 River Road here in Waitley. And uh, this is our 47th year in business. We started the farm in 1968. It was our first year we planted. Today we're, uh, we'll be looking through several uh, aspects of what we're doing here at Nurse Farms. And we're starting here today in the shipping room where we are uh, preparing, uh, because we produce strawberries and raspberries and we sell blueberries, rhubarb, asparagus as part of our catalog items that we sell. So uh, this is the fulfillment area where our, our, our packing crew uh, uh, packs orders and, and you can see they, they go on for the FedEx where the uh, FedEx truck comes daily to pick up the packages. Uh, on Monday we usually fill up, pretty much fill up a trailer load of, of packages. So here's an example of a packing list here for a customer. You can see with the barcoded here. And so as a result, they can go right up with it with there and they, can, they shoot it with a gun. And that brings up the customer up here. Uh, and therefore, the, the plants are put in the box and close the box, put on the scale. They hit the thing and it goes on the pallet. And uh, those will, we're now, we're shipping for Monday. We're preparing boxes to go out Monday right now because it's, we have a lot to do. We can't do them all one day. So we're starting on Wednesday, Thursday, we start shipping for the following Monday. All these little boxes will be going to home gardeners. And right now we're shipping into like Arkansas, North Carolina, the southern states. Um, and, but then, then the 30, 65% uh, of the business goes to commercial growers. And about 35% of the business is distributed to other wholesalers, other catalog companies who have, cat have strawberries and raspberries in there that they offer, but they buy them from us because they don't grow them themselves. We're now in the, in the plant pack packing, in the packing house, where we're actually preparing strawberry plants uh, for, for shipping. So all of the plants you see on the floor here have, were dug, were, we finished digging yesterday, so they were been dug here this spring already. And so they kind of shake out the soil so that, and then they, they fork the plants on the benches where the individual packers take and uh, sort the plants for, uh, to put the, for shipping. Here's a bundle of 25 plants. So you see how they're all uniformly graded. Uh, and all the all the broken plants or the or the uh, small plants are discarded in the waste. And um, there's a box, and there's 40 bundles in a box to make 1,000 plants in a box. Right now, we're packing between 230 and 280,000 plants a day. This will continue until about the middle of May when we'll be finishing up the packing. And, uh, um, and then this crew will go outside and pick berries. So we've been doing this, we've been doing this strawberry packing since the, since the uh, 12th of November. So we packed all winter. And because we, had, we, we, we dig in the November, December, and then we dig, dig again in the spring. So the next part on our tour, we'll, go, we'll be going into our greenhouse operation. And uh, the, uh, the, with the greenhouse operation, all the plants that come out of the tissue culture lab uh, are, grow into the greenhouse to grow roots on them. So there's these little pieces of tissue like you'll, you'll we'll see in the lab, which we saw in the lab, they, and then we'll see them in the greenhouse, the different stages as they go. We have about three acres of, 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 of greenhouses. Uh, that that we use as part of our plant production uh, and the, 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 the facility pack produces about uh, a million million two uh, plants a year 
in this greenhouse we have seven different zones so for each zone to provide the ultimate conditions for those plants in that stage so over here you can see th these are plants that have just just have come out of the lab these were just planted uh, these were planted um, just uh, four days ago and and uh, they're still have no, let's see they they still have not started to root yet let me make sure I get those back um, but it takes it takes it takes a few days for the initiation of the roots then this the, this plant here was planted also on on the 16th and you can see how this little plant has already has gotten roots these are strawberry plants that color light is the best color for growing strawberry and raspberry plants. These are the new, those new, that new technology on lights. That's what I see off the highway. Yes. It's like, looks purple. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's a place down on, down, uh, down the other side right of Waitley. Down south and then yeah. kind of right. Yes. Yep. That's, yeah, that's, uh, that's Full Bloom Farm. And, and they grow herbs and stuff. But the, we have, the, it's the same color. It's obviously, we, that's for the crops we grow. Yeah, yeah. Because you can change this from red to, to white color just just by just just by yeah. going to the computer as the humidity gets to a certain level the misters come on automatically we have bottom heat the bottom it, the heat is right here in the bottom so you have so you have the heat right where the roots where we want to grow the roots of the lights and then you see we have shade up there so we can with the shade we can control the heat in here so it's not too hot and dry and and then above the shade we have a uh, it's it's called a thermal curtain so coming in December uh, it's uh, start it's 20 it's four o'clock 20 degrees the, uh, the thermal shuts holds the heat in uh, into the greenhouse so there's all these automated systems for making uh, labor savings and making these plants as happy as we can plant roots uh, particularly strawberry and raspberries they don't like it really hot and humid they want a, a cooling a more cool so th th these are off of the bottom heat and that high humidity after they got rooted then in here they come in here to to push them along to get to completing the growth cycle so you see plants in here at all different levels you also see one of our automatic waterers there and that's also on the computer and and that machine goes along this track and and to to uh, help us uh, complete the watering because because we have plants at different stages of growth in here we still have to hand water so that we have the evenness of the watering but this with that we can use that boom to get everything wet in a hurry or in a regular period of time without uh, because if we can get over the ground faster than when hand waters this is another growing zone that we're in as you can tell it's cool yeah. so these these plants now these these these, these are all finished so they are uh, you see they've got a nice ball of roots and these are ready to go to the field they're almost ready to go to the field but in here it's cooled down it's soft it, the extended growth the soft growth is hardened so that when we get ready to plant in in in, in april uh, these plants will be hardened off and ready to go into the field here we're in a different section of the house and you can tell by the temperature in here we are hardening all, everything off and this and because these plants are very close to being able to plant so with these with these blackberries then the, the, there's a well well defined root plug so the the uh, and we're just um, we're just um, finalizing the hours of chill and the hardening and and this this bench of uh, plants is scheduled to uh, as soon as they have the, enough hardening off they'll be shipped to California
So when we built this greenhouse, the, uh, the, the Conservation Commission, because we we're close to the ditch, uh, asked us what, where all the water from the runoff would go from this greenhouse. Because it, with a one inch rain on, a, on, a, on an acre of ground is like 15,000 gallons. So as a way to accommodate the runoff from the greenhouse, we built this tank uh, that holds the, the water from the runoff. And so uh, when, when, when the tank is full after a rain, then we have, we're not buying water from the town to, to water, the, water the plants. So we're, we're getting, collecting the, the runoff and, and using it for our, uh, using it for, for, the, for the watering of the plants. So this machine here takes and, and it, it fluffs up the soil and then it, it, it's like a sausage maker and it, 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 pu it pushes the soil into this, into this fiber material and seals it. You can buy them like this but it's cheaper to buy your own machine and, and make them and so. So in a tissue culture lab, there, there are three sections, there are three parts to a lab uh, in a tissue culture lab. Right here, we're in the production area. In the production area, we, we mix the, the, the medium, and in the medium has all the growing requirements that plants need to grow, uh, plus uh, different, uh, uh, different hormones and so forth. These units here are autoclave units, and an autoclave unit sterilizes the containers uh, to reduce contamination of the cultures. Uh, the, the, the autoclave period is at uh, 250 degrees for 20 minutes. Is a, is a, it's kind of a light autoclave, but uh, it's, it, 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 it works in the process of removing uh, different agents that would cause uh, uh, in, um, contamination of the cultures. So this is the growth room and as you see this is a sizable space and in, in the growth room the, there's the lights to have uh, 16 hour days because strawberries and raspberries are all long day plants they they grow the best with on 16 hour days so there's light there's automatic lights that turn the lights on and shut the lights off so it's dark for eight hours but it's light for 16 hours this container here happens to be strawberry plants and the uh, you can see the clumps of plants in there where they have started to grow they grow into clumps and uh, um, and, and they would be also ready for transferring. Now if you look in there, these were just transferred. Here you can see they're just starting to grow into the clumps and, and so the, this would, these, these, would be, these, these would be transferred in, in probably another two weeks. And, and one of the considerations with agriculture, we, we only produce about 10 or 15 percent of the people who, who because uh, each one of us feeds 100 and, 150 families each farm in the U.S. So the one percent of us are farmers. So we, so all the arts and science, pathology, entomology, plant breeding are all going to come from people who are interested in these as careers. But there's a lot of careers, and it's it's a it's, it's a very challenging uh, it's very challenging career, you know types of uh, careers to be involved with. So. All right, so this is Poplar Hill Farm. Um, this was a dairy farm while I grew up until 98 when my father sold the cows. Um, we always had a small beef herd, so beef is what we got into. Um, the farm kind of limped along. My brother and I were still pretty young. Um, as we got older and took more interest, you know, ended up with more cows. Now we have a herd of 65. We have 32 brood cows. That means cows that have a calf every year. So that's 32 babies every year. Um, we'd like to get up to 
a herd of 150 to 200 animals in the next five years, um, be able to have 50 finished animals a year, 50 or so brood cow, mother cows. Um, to feed the 60 cows, we grow 40 to 50 acres of field corn every year. Um, we make round bales, we make dry hay. Uh, we have we sell dry hay to a few uh, large horse farms in the area. Um, it's a lot of work, and um, between this and Bear Path Compost, I'm a pretty busy guy. My name's Melanie Chorak, and this is Potash Hill Farm, and those are the goats. <laughs> And generally, we breed every year, but this year we're not. I lost the goat, my buck, um, a couple of years ago, so we don't have any babies this year. But um, that's when we, you know, it, they get milked, is after they've kitted. So, need a buck, and um, so probably this fall I'll rebreed. And then I freeze the milk. You know, I use it, the fresh milk, but then I also have a surplus of milk that I freeze for the following year. So that's how you stay ahead of that. Only three have bells on, and that's to so I can find them. <laughs> and they also, they travel in the pack. Oh yeah, they always stay together, and they have the bells on. Hopefully, to you know, it keeps the predators away. Which, thank God, that's worked. So <laughs> that's why they. Not many animals like. Noise. Yeah, but some of them lose their bells, so. Yeah, and then I just found one that's been lost for like three years. I just found it the other day. I milk the babies in the um, in that little white capped. Not the babies, the mothers, the does. And the, there's a divider in there, so the babies stay on one side at night, and then in the morning, I milk the dough out. That's how that gets done. So, and we probably milk about, I don't know, for three, yeah, I want to say three months straight. That's the hay barn. And then the horses, I get a couple of horses oh, down in the too. Yeah, and they, so it's open for them yeah. below, and then that, the hay gets stored in, up above. Yeah. And they're all born here. They've all they're all born here, except for that white, you know, the the really large white one. Yeah. She was not, but everybody else was born here. Yeah, I'm getting ready to make soap actually because I'm running out of uh, produce. So these are the oils I use, and then I've got goat's milk that I use in the freezer, and then those are the products that come out of that. So, and this is the box the soap gets poured into and then it takes then I put wood and t uh, blankets over it and because um, it's got to saponify the fats and the um, the lye mixture have to bond and then after 24 hours um, the soap gets taken out of the tray you know and I use this counter and and then it's got to sit I had a sheep come here, a big ram. Yeah, it was Start huge. Yeah, he just he just showed up. And well, I tried catching him up in the woods one day. My neighbor told me that there was a ram loose out there. So then I couldn't catch him. And uh, so then I was out here, you know, working and stuff. And then all of a sudden he just showed up. He showed up right here. And my whole herd of goats were right here wondering what I was doing. And they saw the ram and they all took off into their corral because they think they're safe in there. Mm. If the door, I mean, they are safe in there, but it was just kind of mm. funny. This ram just showed up out of nowhere. The dog surprised them enough. <laughs> that one does. Well, she does too, but you know, they, they get rambunctious. Like, they look kind of like foxes, so I can sort of see why. Well, this one is named Foxy, and a couple of weeks ago, I was down there on the bank. And I was calling Foxy, and it was actually a real fox. <laughs> wow. I got close to it. I was like, oh, my God, it's a fox. And what, why it was here was because Foxy went and stole some of her. It must have been she stole something out of the den. Um, how many times have the goats tried to eat your clothing? Oh, all the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, they try to eat clothing they all the time. They very interested in the camera. Yeah, really? Yeah. yeah. 
they're usually interested in they're anything that you're doing, you yeah. know, they're anything you're doing, they'll be interested in. Hi, I'm Janelle Wilkins. Um, I'm the event manager here with the Quanquat Farm, and you are in our event facility here. We are a 5,000 square foot building, and we do a lot of weddings and other special events here. We're able to see up to 200 people. Um, we provide our clients with tables and chairs and lots of space for a good time. Out back, we have a lovely patio, which is where we typically hold social hours for our events. It's a great spot to enjoy the property and enjoy some food and beverages. And then we have a couple ceremony locations on the property as well for our wedding clients. One of them is just straight ahead in the lawn and we have apple orchards on the property as well for pick your own fruit and um, ceremony locations there as well. Hideaway, you yeah, to I know. <laughs> We're definitely kind of a, a hidden gem for people, so it's fun when they can come out and see how beautiful the property is and what a nice job everyone's done on it. So um, we have been a functioning event space for almost five years now, um, and the farm itself has been in operation for much longer than that. We used to be a dairy farm, um, and then the current owners have owned the property and breathed some new life into it for about 15 or 16 years now. It's beautiful here in the fall. Um, every season's my favorite season here. <laughs> The only famous guest that I know of is Rachel Maddow was here um, a couple years ago now. So we opened May 1st for the season, um, so I've been giving tours and, and all that good stuff. So we have quite a few weddings starting right in the beginning of May. A couple nonprofit events come in as well. So yeah, we, we've got a busy season ahead of us. We run May to, through October. My name is Leslie Harris, L-E-S-L-I-E-H-A-R-R-I-S, -E -R -R and I'm the farm manager here at Quan Quan Farm and Orchard. Well, Quan Quan has been around since the 1920s in some capacity or another. We were originally a big dairy farm that was famous around the country for the quality of its cattle and the production of milk. And today, since the 70s actually, Quan Quan has been known as a pick your own fruit orchard. So we have blueberries, peaches, and apples in season between July and October every year. This time of year is a dormant time of year for all of our fruit trees and, and bushes. They're just now coming into bud. So we spend, most people think farmers take like the, the time off at this time of year, but in fact, we have just completed the pruning of our blueberry patches. So that took months to do. We have about 1,800 blueberry patches or blueberry bushes. And each one of those blueberry bushes gets individual attention and you have to make sure that the bush is growing well and succeeding. One of the really wonderful things about Quan Quan Farm is we embrace our wildlife population. We believe there's food enough for everybody. We have wildlife cameras around our property that keeps track of all the comings and goings of the critters we share our farm with. And that includes everybody from beavers to muskrats to blue herons and green herons, a variety of different types of birds. And we also have bears and bobcats and deer and rabbits and a whole glorious panoply of animals that we like to share our orchards and fields with. And we also are very interested in maintaining a healthy pollinator, pollinator uh, population. So we have, you can't see it now because nothing's quite in flower yet, but we have a whole range of flowers that bloom at different times of year to encourage pollinators to come first to pollinate our orchards and then also to stick around for a little longer and pollinate the flowers that are here. So imagine this when it's gonna be lush and green and colorful and filled with juicy fruit. Oh, I'm Miriam Boudry, and this is Tallgrass Farm. Stop it, stop it. girls, open girls, uh, and last year's Korea. These are last year's Korea.
These are last year's Korea, and they were born between June and August. We like to have spring births. Um, it gives them the benefit of the sunshine and lush pastures, and they get a little weight on before the winter. So right now they're weaning, and during that time, uh, we teach them how to walk on lead, and they get their toenails trimmed for the first time. They get their first series of shots. But uh, pretty much alpacas are quite an easy livestock to maintain. They uh, get a yearly rabies and CDT shots and they uh, graze on the pasture and they get uh, a grain and a second cut hay. They're raised for their fiber. Their fiber is comparable to cashmere. So now um, the fiber industry is, is really coming along in the United States. And um, anywhere from sports coat and overcoats to upholstery, rugs, you name it. Plus they have a wonderful uh, compost. We have our manure pad back there and um, pretty much it goes as quick as we get it in the summertime. Uh, people come and get truckloads of it. It's, it's not a harsh manure, so it could be fresh and you put it, you dig a hole, you put it in the hole, you put a plant right on top mm. of it and it thrives. It really does wonderful, wonderful things for your, <laughs> for your gardens. Llamas start at about 200 and go up to like 300 or uh, whereas an alpaca is going to top out at, at 200. In fact, I only have one female on my farm that's, that weighs that much. The alpaca is bred really primarily for their fiber, whereas a llama is a pack animal. They're quite, they're quite friendly. Um, they really have their own little, <laughs> their own little uh, personalities. So they get shorn once a year, usually in May in New England. And um, we belong to the New England Fiber Co-op. So they get our harvest and in turn we get uh, finished goods. Socks and hats and mittens and scarves. And alpaca can be worn by anybody. They're, uh, some people that have a wool al allergy won't have it with the alpacas. There's no lanolin in their fiber. It's very clean. So you could actually shear it and spin it right into yarn, whereas sheep or wool, <laughs> you would have to scour. Oh gosh, she's got her little, her little wire there. And so you go to shows. Yep, we actually compete. Um, our first show is going to be um, at the Big E. It's the North American Alpaca Show. And this year they're combining it with the Northeast Alpaca Expo, which is usually held in Syracuse. So these are moms. We just had the vet out and um, we have uh, four pregnant for this year. There's actually 22 natural colors of alpacas. It's the widest range of color in any fiber bearing animal in the world. So you have um, from pure white to jet black, um, a variety of different grays, tans, um, there's even, if you, uh, she almost has like a maroon color to her fiber. When they get shorn, um, we use every bit of their fiber, but the prime fiber is their blanket, which would be this area here. And then their neck and leg fiber are seconds and thirds. And that's used for socks or uh, rugs. Um, the prime blanket fiber um, is what you would be doing, anything that's really close to your skin, your sweaters and coats and um, scarves, mittens, hats. The big designers now are starting to utilize alpaca, which is a great thing. And a lot of your uh, big name catalogs, L.L. Bean and um, 
they're, you're, they're starting to feature alpaca apparel, which is a good thing. Hmm. Is anything you're wearing alpaca? My socks. <laughs> alpaca socks are the best. Oh, <laughs>